Celebrating and Taking Charge of ADHD is an innovative group coaching program incorporating mindfulness as an essential tool throughout. This podcast addresses a number of topics that we face on a day-to-day basis and celebrates the precious human life we have all been given. Welcome to Celebrating ADHD podcast. This is episode 18 and I'm joined today by Jamie Pastillion, who's the hypnosis um, specialist for ADHD. So we're going to be looking specifically around the area of sensitivity, but also looking at the superpower of intuition. Hi, Sue. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of happy to be here as well. I, I think I've been looking at your website and what you're doing, and it's really, really cool, cool stuff. I love um, celebrating ADHD, but also taking charge of it. I like how that's also part of it, because I think celebrating ADHD, we sometimes think maybe that would be being a bit soft, but this is like taking charge of it as well. So I think that's what it's about, compassion and action. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamie, for your support. So maybe you can start with telling us a little bit about your ADHD story. Yeah, so I'm Jamie Vasilian, and I call myself the hypnosis for ADHD specialist. And so I've got ADHD. I was diagnosed in 2004 at the age of 24. And um, obviously I was, I always had ADHD, but that was, I was reading, um, I think it was driven to distraction um, and reading that. And at some point I started crying because it was, it was just a case of, oh, this is me. You know, this is me. It's, it's, I'm reading about myself. I uh, was aware I was different, but I kind of had some of my own pet names, I guess, that that pointed towards ADHD. I used to call it Hawk Syndrome because uh, hawks move their heads a lot and they track <laughs> movement. And that's something I noticed in myself. And I've also noticed in other people with ADHD. So I call it Hawk Syndrome. So I kind of had like different names for it growing up. Um, of course, mm. then I'm reading a book and then it like hits me like a ton of bricks. This is it. And I say that because also because I was in and out of the psychiatrist's office since um, the age of about, I think it was 12 up until 24. I was in and out wow. all the time. And um, mm. I had EEG. Um, I did have some unusual results from an EEG, in fact. So I'm surprised they didn't pick it up then. It said mm. rare and, un- and unusual levels of theta waves in the right hemisphere during relaxation. Um, that means on an EEG when you're asked to close your eyes your brain yeah. waves change anyway but that they said it was rare and unusual but but the test was being done to see if I had epilepsy which they thought maybe I had it came back that I didn't have epilepsy but it that was it it was just okay you know he doesn't have ep- epilepsy tick what's going on you know and I, I remember one doctor trying to give me some meds saying that I have a theory that your brain goes too fast and your brain makes mistakes it 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 jumps the gun and it misinterprets things, you know, um, that was not very helpful either. It was just kind of felt like people were just throwing stuff and trying to make it stick. I don't think anyone really knew what was going on. And when I came across that book, it all made sense. You know, I got diagnosed and it came out as ADHD. It uh, was attention deficit, hyperactive and impulsive. So the whole lot, that's basically how, how that came about. Thank you for sharing. It's amazing about the theta waves in the brain. There's been mm. studies done on that with monks, how it changes things in the brain. I understand you do quite a bit of meditation as well. How does that help? So, uh, well, <laughs> this is, this is a, a weird one, but I got into meditation very young. Um, I actually started meditation seven years old um I didn't know that it was meditation it was just maybe it wasn't maybe it was spacing out but I would sit there for long periods of time just kind of focusing on the breath and I would my main meditation I suppose technique was to focus on a point um I know now from decades of looking into meditative practices and the names for these different parts of you know we could fit that in with um 
some of the technique of meditation obviously a component of it is to be able to focus um yeah. i can remember what they is it dhyana or something in, in the kind of the indian uh, or kind of yogic word yeah, for the it yogic, but, yeah, dhyana, um, and then yeah yeah the samadhi right but i came across a book um many many years uh, after that started and mm. um it actually referred to the the technique that i was practicing at a young age so i didn't know anything about this i was basically staring at a point and i was i thought i didn't have to i was meant to keep my eyes open not blink not scratch ignore all kind of physical sensations and just focus on the breath and focus on the point and that's what i did and I was able to do that, surprisingly enough, even though I, I have ADHD, I was able to focus on something for very long periods of time. So in this book, um, what was it called? It was, it, was, um, it was called The Overself. And he went off to India and he, he was the guy that um, went off to India and kind of researched yoga and met the mm -hmm. yogis and measured their brain activity and stuff like that. He was one of the original yeah. guys. Um, Dr. Paul Brunton, that's it. And so in that book, funny enough, it, it mentioned a technique called tricata, and that's the meditative practice of focusing on a point, not blinking. Um, but it did warn that you should not go any longer than eight minutes. I actually did go much, much longer than eight minutes. So I didn't have a teacher there to tell me, you know, that maybe I was yeah. doing something that was unhelpful. Um, and funny enough, in 2003, I was part of a, a Buddhist, it was an, I was calling it a kind of, because it was, it was a Buddhist, scientist and it was um a, a kind of a different practice now these two practices were only 10 minutes long and um we were meant to do it twice a day for 10 minutes so mm. it, so this was over 12 weeks we did it was a test for creativity and um but in the the end of the study i was walking into the classroom sitting in the chair cross-legged not moving sitting very very still and people in my class were amazed at the difference in my behavior. Um, but when they yeah. measured, when she measured my brain activity, she was stunned. Um, she was jaw dropped, in fact, um, because she was looking at the screen and she come and she was playing with the wires and playing with the uh, sensor on my fingers, and it was just like a flat line on the screen. And I joked that maybe I was, maybe I was dead. And then eventually she said, "No, don't worry, you're not dead." <laughs> Anyway, she, she, she said some things that were quite, quite astonishing because she was normally quite reserved. And she showed me what's called a Fourier analysis, which from what I could tell is kind of pretty much just like a bar graph. So I, I couldn't understand what this little li these lines meant. But when she showed it to me on a Fourier analysis, it showed that my brain was basically all lit up from mm. one to 40 hertz. And it was literally like a hill of frequency like that with no gaps. So she showed me before my brain scan going back the beginning of the 12 weeks and my brain scan showed interestingly enough just like the eeg that i had done before i had a lot of theta activity like a peak in theta activity but i was there were sections that were literally missing you know so for alpha and maybe beta there was like gaps and lack of frequency you know generated in the brain which basically is what we tend to see with adhd so my brain was generating a lot of uh, slow activity, but not the faster stuff. And um, but now my brain was literally like a hill with no gaps. And that led me on to when I was. Um, so this was a, a college that I was at in Bristol. And mm. there was a friend of a friend. And I already had kind of bumped into seen her, her son at the school, at the college. Um, but she so she said, can you help a friend of mine, her son? Um, appears to be he may have ADHD he's getting into trouble at school mm. and um, and they said do you think you might be able to help him in some way yeah um, they obviously knew that I had you know by this point aware that I had ADHD this was a bit later it's like 2004 ish so and to be honest I kind of was just didn't really know what to do I mean I already knew about hypnosis then I already knew about meditation what I did was I just thought well follow my intuition and um, we attempted some things at the beginning, kind of like breath meditation. But he um, he did he was quite a wriggler. He was like like I was. Didn't seem to be. I'm not saying there was nothing. It, that it wasn't good what we did. The second time round, so I yeah. saw him again. The next time I saw him was about a week later. I decided to take a different course rather than focusing on his breath. I said, imagine that you're a tree, 
imagine you're growing roots down into the earth imagine le your, your leaves going up yeah and it was kind of more like a visualization perhaps in some way similar to hypnosis because doing that kind of thing I, I'm um, you know I would likely be using some suggestion um, and um, you know I've done that kind of visualization many times since you know imagine you're a tree you feel stable your roots are going down into ground and talking about how you're getting your nutrients into your body everything your body needs and your mind and so it's kind of um some kind of you know some kind of suggestive visualization type mm. work as well so maybe not exactly what we'd think is classical meditation like focusing on the breath but what happened was he sat there and i was stunned i was amazed he literally changed in front of my eyes suddenly he was sat in the chair and you could see his eyes were closed you could see he was there or he was here he was like present really present mm -hmm. and you could almost feel this calmness like oozing from him like this energy in the room a few weeks later i was informed that the school had dropped the seeking of a diagnosis and that his behavior changed in classroom and at home and he was mm -hmm. fine and yeah so that wow. was kind of the beginning uh, as well of I didn't get into working with people with ADHD at that point. That was just what happened. Something I think is very helpful for anyone with ADHD to, or if you have children with ADHD is, I saw a wonderful article in attitude.com recently, and it was by a young person kind of speaking quite strongly to parents, saying, you need to know this about your child with ADHD. You need to know that they can't do the kind of thing that you do. They can't go into the job mm. maybe that mum and dad wants them to do. To get the ADHD brain switched on, it almost like it forces us, or at least I think that's kind of the, the silver lining. I think everything has is, 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 is got two sides to it. And I think ADHD has got a lot, of, a lot to give. There is a lot to celebrate. Absolutely. In a sense, it forces you to have to be truly you, to be fully present, to, to live your life as much as you possibly can, whatever that means to you, not anyone else, living the life you're meant to live to live because if you don't do that i don't i think you're going to struggle to get your brain switched on and that mm. you know that is one of the one of the key things about not just managing adhd but potentially mastering it you've got to live your life on your terms as much as you possibly can i know that's not that can be that can be really challenging but but that's something to aim for and that will make such a big difference I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So just accept who you are and and go with do it, trying to find something that you'd love to do and do that. Yes. Yeah. So you followed your intuition. Although it's kind of obvious that I would do ADHD, I guess I've always had always had a strong interest in, in spirituality. I'm curious about something. Mm. A lot of uh, my clients I work with, they seem to seek disapproval. It's kind of that not taking responsibility for choosing where you want to go, more than getting that approval from mum, dad, or friends, colleagues, or whatever. I found myself constantly seeking approval from others, rather than saying, right, I'm going to go and do this. Mm. and is it intuition or is it a symptom of ADHD, not having that self-confidence to just drive forward with the idea, regardless? Are you, are you referring to the example I gave or? Yeah. I think that was just intuition. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's seeking approval. I think I was, it was more, if anything, maybe it was kind of like a fear of, failure or making the wrong choice i think that's maybe yeah. what it was or i don't know it's a bit but it's, it's what it's, it's kind of like how we often look at these things we kind of create like a a mental construct to explain oh this is this is what's going on here i mean it could be on various mm -hmm. levels but it, it doesn't strike me as a as an approval situation when it comes to approval i don't really know um i because when you when you kind of like think about that, I suppose you would. At the same time, you think of, do I seek approval, um, and then maybe as a comparison, in comparison to who, like you know, um, mm -hmm. does everyone seek approval to some extent? Is this a? 
is this a healthy level of approval or whatever? I don't know. Um, I think well, I, I, I certainly have done, but I think on some other levels, um, a lot of the time the well, I think, I, yeah, I've certainly have sought approval throughout my life. Um, that's been yeah. part of my part of my experience, but also, but at the same time, I've always been very that I I will do what I feel is me or what is right, uh, even mm. if other people don't like it. So, but I have battled with other people not approving what I'm doing or or the way that I do things or or, or yeah. me. I have battled with that. Um, and mm. that's some, something that I've recognized and worked on is, is to let go of, of the need for approval. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. it's that need for recognition. I've definitely recognized that in my own life. It's been the most suffering thing because mm. within um, an intimate relationship, mm. constantly looking for a recognition and approval because that's someone important to me. And I want to be known that I'm a good girl. Kind of ingrained, it was. It was, had to really dig deep to find out where the source of it what came from. The other day, I mean, just contemplating on the need for uh, recognition, looking at. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Adler's psychology and mm. how he mm -hmm. basically looked at um, the need for recognition is linked to reward and punishment. So how we are right. treated at school is you do this and then you get a gold star. You don't mm -hmm. do that, you get a, a red X. Mm. And that mentality stays with us in our adult life, really deep rooted in our society, this, puni this reward and punishment, which um, makes us seek that approval. Mm. We want to be seen as normal. So we develop these mm. imposter syndromes. We develop all these, these things um, as coping strategies. Yeah, I, I definitely developed uh, imposter syndrome. And, and um, I remember growing up and being the black sheep or uh, mm. being the outsider and a part of me wanting to fit in but knowing that in a way I probably couldn't and um and it's interesting because there were I suppose as I got older I started to I developed being the class clown I think that was one of my coping mm. strategies be the yeah. class clown make people <laughs> laugh um be like eccentric and crazy and, and, and a part of me wanting to be popular or and uh, but as I've yeah. gone older it's kind of today I feel like I have few friends but they're high quality whereas when I was younger it was oh you could be that popular person and lots of friends and and you kind of good with communication and how to fit in and this kind of stuff and and that's where I actually made quite a few I think mistakes um mm. growing up where which impacted on my life in a in a negative way that you know or took away from things that could have been more um wholesome for me yeah. um but I, I think I've learned that now learned that lesson and um and today it's more about quality um mm. you know it's kind of like now you've got like social media and you can have like thousands of friends um <laughs> apparently you, um, buy them in. you hear about these people that have so many friends um and they show their lifestyles and and you know and, and picture their self to live a particular that they're this particular person and mm. present themselves in a certain way and you just kind yeah. of like realize well it's all kind of Quite a lot of that is quite false anyway and not not as important as maybe you thought it was when you were younger um and uh yeah from as i've gotten older i think is why i've growing up i always kind of identified as an extrovert and i thought that was part of adhd but i know it's mm. not actually that simple um no. you know you can be an introvert with adhd but when i think about it i've always on tests of um like personality testing showed that I was actually in the middle uh, I feel slightly extrovert but it was only slight it could be you know uh, in fact it would if I did if I retested it would random it would fluctuate yes yeah. so, um now at now 43 years old um I I've always had a need to be to go within and have time alone to regenerate kind of 
catch mm. up. Um, you know, I, I like social situations and activity, but I also equally love being on my own, being out in nature, you know, sit, you know, yeah. sitting in meditation, <laughs> um, in my own inner universe. Um, and so I, I and I feel like life is about balance. But as mm. I've got older, I feel like more and more happy to be this is part maybe it's part of getting older but not in a bad way i think it's a good thing mm. um, um also being having more control of my of my brain's need for stimulation um i found ways to kind of satiate that biologically the brain is kind of um happier to, to have more of those kind of um quieter experiences i suppose and and yeah. um yeah I'm deleting my social media. Uh, what was I deleting my Facebook account as well? So that was that was a good thing. Deleting that okay. that made a big difference to, to my brain and my and wow. my uh, my mental health and happiness and peace of mind was just to you know delete. I do have um, I have um, I I have Facebook account for um, Jamie Vasilian, but my kind of personal account I deleted. Yeah. Um, yeah and and I always knew when I what I I would have a, I would have a like a, a dopamine detox a social media detox that i would come off or if i came off the internet for a period of time and completely didn't use it it's an oscillation like, isn't it because it, yeah. it it's sometimes you know someone will make a comment or someone will like you and then you you make that to mean dopamine when they don't like you or they say something very derogatory you can be highly sensitive to that mm. Mm. And that leads on to the next thing mm. that we're going to talk about is this sensitivity, if we can, and mm -hmm. explore that. Because within myself, very sensitive um, to specifically to, to feedback and uh, criticism. I know that I need I need to have it and I want to take it on board because it's the only way that things grow, because not everyone sees the things that I see. People see different things. So you have to welcome that in. But the actual feeling attached to it can be mm -hmm. very, very draining. Um, so you could have negative feelings of shame and uh, I'm not good enough. That's what ultimately what it comes down to. So how can you address that with the treatment of hypnotherapy well i mean there's the simple way of understanding it and and it, and it can be more complex so i mean it's also very personal to each person i don't think there is any simple answer to that so hypnosis is working with you know with the subconscious we're mm. at the end of the day we're mostly subconscious anyway our mind is mostly subconscious and a lot of this are subconscious patterns of thoughts beliefs um maybe previous experiences and messages that we've internalized over the years um and we may aim we may try to change that consciously um but we all know what happens when we tend to do that it tends not to be very effective and you know in some forms of therapy may be helpful um sometimes they may not um and 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 hypnosis can be helpful because it helps us to get to the sub more of a subconscious uh level so what what i mean by that is is that for example if we're doing counseling cbt or any other form of therapy as we're mostly subconscious there must most of our communication is subconscious so mm. we're always doing some kind of work with the subconscious but hypnosis is really about it's more of a direct line that's how i like to think of it it's not um and it's 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 about a different type of communication so that you work with the client in a way that you would do in other forms of therapy um you know we're talking about things we're um questioning things we're reflecting on things we're um challenging things and we're asking good questions to get good answers and we're setting intentions um and that would seem to be a more of a conscious process like i say we're mostly subconscious it's actually more of a subconscious process but that's the kind of the more conscious side of it that you would see in, in in all forms of therapy or coaching but where mm -hmm. hy hypnosis comes in is that we then use the um daydream state as a way to um create a uh, to allow the brain subconscious to in a sense percolate on what we've just talked about 
mm-hmm. you know, because why that's so important is um, is that we don't do everything consciously. We do most of our learning, our unlearning, our relearning, everything we're doing is mostly subconscious. We think it's conscious, but it's not. You know, our conscious mind is just meant to ask good questions and really, you know, kind of we get clear about what we want um, and um, a bit like our compass. But but well, the, what, we don't uh, want. Have to, <laughs> what we don't want, what, what we need to let go of. But we need to trust the subconscious. We need to trust that we are mostly subconscious, 90 to maybe 99.99999 percent subconscious. Some people even argue we're, we're just we're subconscious. But. Um, I don't mm-hmm. personally believe that. I believe that we are, we have a conscious mind, mm. and that's what makes us different from animals. Is so, what gets us into trouble. It's a double-edged sword. It can get us into trouble because we start to think that we do everything with our conscious mind, and we start to kind of get in the way of a lot of these automatic processes, or we don't understand that we have a subconscious and a conscious mind. So um, when we think about what we want, we might be thinking about it in a way that actually programs the subconscious or um, reinforces what we don't want so for example we might talk about what we don't want literally uh, you know I don't want to be stressed Um, and the subconscious is the equivalent of like a seven-year-old so the seven-year-old hears you don't want to be stressed it just hears the word stress it doesn't compute the word don't it just hears stress and it tends to give you more of that so we get clear about what we want we go into the subconscious uh, sorry the hypnotic state and it's a chance just to let the subconscious percolate because in that state of mind, and it's something that naturally happens for all of us. Um, we all, if if someone's in a lecture, 20 minutes, they start to daydream. And they've got to like, cycle every 20 minutes. You start to want to internalize because your mm. brain needs to be able to consolidate that. Now, that's actually a smaller um, kind of biorhythm uh, of something that happens in 24 hours. In the daytime, you learn, you stimulate your brain, you take in your information. Um, on the evening, I mean bedtime, you go to sleep. That's when your brain is going to consolidate. That's when your brain kind of sorts through everything. And mm. so we think we're doing it all consciously. Um, most of it is it's happening yeah. in the background. It's in the background of awareness. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. With uh, self-esteem, feeling. Um, you know, when we feel hurt um, uh, and I've I've experienced all this myself and 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 still do sometimes that, you know, I'm a very sensitive soul. Um, and I think it is a core aspect of ADHD. Um, and it's like anything, it's it's because it's just kind of for us, I guess it seems quite well for, for other people. It seems quite extreme at our level of sensitivity. And again, it's a double edged sword because um, it's what can make us um very effective in certain with certain things you know i think um anyone with adhd that does some kind of counseling or some kind of working with other people that sensitivity actually comes in very helpful Mm. um sensitivity i think comes in helpful in hypnosis because you're learning to become more sensitive to what would normally be outside of your conscious awareness kind of you know you know reading various things of maybe intonation of voice or noticing whether the person that you're working with is actually relaxing or not. Um, It comes in handy in all sorts of situations, um, in communication with other people on a daily basis, but it it can go the other way too. You know, we can get the, uh, it's, um, and part of it is is not being able to control that. It's, it's, Mm. we feel like it's just happening to us, Um, but we can, um, we can experience improvements with that various means including hypnosis it can help us yeah. to learn to one of the core things that i do if there was a, something i would say was core to what i'm actually doing in hypnosis um that i become really really you know like you already know something but it's becoming more and more really really aware that that this is about regulation so what i'm really teaching people with adhd is how to regulate how to regulate your attention um focus uh, sorry focus um relaxation calmness and then you know and 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 how we also regulate our emotions and yeah and for me is is one of the biggest things that we 
that we need is to is how to learn to regulate absolutely yeah the, the, that is the uh, emotional regulation which mindfulness mm. can help with as well definitely, definitely. but i guess um what's coming to mind is how effective is it um compared to cognitive behavioral therapy from a clinical perspective i would say it's it's i'm biased i would i i've um many times thought mm, maybe I, I shouldn't push the hypnosis maybe it should be like coaching or cbt or something and it's kind of like oh i use hypnosis just bring it in there without anyone really knowing or say it's a visualization or would you like to try hypnosis as well but then i realized that hypnosis is so powerful that i would just be messing around we might as well just go we might as well just not we must just go straight for hypnosis because i think it has an edge and that's because the we're working more with the subconscious mind people with adhd need to learn how to relax and that's mm. a big part of what hypnosis is also feel the sensitivity aspect of it is that when people have adhd they're actually a lot of people with adhd won't want to hear this no one wants to hear this the idea that we're more suggestible or that we're more hypnotizable or we need to understand hypnosis. We need to understand our subconscious mind and suggestion because um, my theory is that is that people with ADHD, because of their sensitivity, are also more sensitive um, to suggestion, um, mm. and that they there is more of a stronger imprint in the subconscious mind. This, for example, can relate to um, the sensitivity in the in the way that you were talking about earlier. If someone says something about you or looks you in a certain way um, and other people, it kind of um, it's like water off a duck's back, perhaps, mm. or they let go of it quicker. But with us, it kind of it leaves an imprint in the in the mind. Um, and we know from research that people that are more likely to become traumatized or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder um, or anxiety, um, they tend to share something in common. They tend to share that they're more sensitive and again i think that's the connection mm. here of adhd people with adhd are more sensitive too so we're more likely to um to have this strong imprint left in the subconscious and then we struggle our brain goes into like a repetition and we keep thinking about it over and over you know what i said to that person how they reacted to me and and it goes around mm. in a loop and mm. and it's in a sense of reinforcing suggestion in the subconscious mind so i think hypnosis is really helpful in that sense too um, okay so oh. i have a question when the subconscious has a deep-rooted belief and it could go way back to childhood when we're at school and we want to get that approval and we want to be part of the wow. gang but they don't want to be part they don't want us part of it you get the imprint i'm not good enough right, can right. hypnosis change that belief and make it sustainable right yeah I, I think so because what we need to do like i say is get to the subconscious level so what we're talking about here well we're just talking about making it sustainable yeah I, if you can do it i'm game i want to do it yeah maybe that's an experiment and, and see and and yeah I, I think in a way that's part of the answer to the question is it really is you know everyone's experience is different and um and people respond differently. You know, one of the things I often talk about with hypnosis that people respond, obviously it's not exactly like this, it's more like a wave, but some people respond mm. like this. So that people have like a different response to hypnosis in, in terms of, you might think of as, of um, oh, you know, oh, this is working, you know? Some people seem to respond quickly um, and some people seem to take a little bit longer, but it's a bit like putting the heating on and you don't necessarily know that it's really on until perhaps you check and notice that there is heat coming from the radiator. It's just that maybe the room is bigger. Maybe there isn't as much, um, it's letting, you know, the walls aren't um, aren't as, yeah, they're, not, they're letting out too much heat or whatever it is, or it's a bigger room. And, um, and so it kind of like creeps up on us, so to speak. But um, some of it is repetition and some of it is just um, understanding what is actually really going on and, and um, you know, like you say, with an imprint. So if there's something that happened in the past, that's not normally the route I go with clients, because one of the things that I've noticed, in fact, I had a client recently 
um, that was talking about how they just they only had like um, a couple of sessions and some of the things they were talking about seemed to resolve very quickly um, mm. without even necessarily going into it. Um, because when the brain gets into a more relaxed state, um, when we switch from the survival brain, which is where we'll be when we think about um, that maybe I'm not good enough or I don't fit in, um, because what's one of the biggest fears we would have would be being outside of the tribe, right? Would be would it be yeah, isolated, isolated. From, from from the crew, from right? Society, from society, yeah. From society, so we grew up in like you know units of maybe about hundred people throughout most of our history. They they say so, um, but we just by it's as simple as this. We can make it more complex, but as simply speaking, if we can get relaxed enough, we switch from here into the front of our brain, our left prefrontal cortex. Mm. I actually experienced this through, um, and my clients experience it too as well. Um, and you may experience yourself, Sue, that sometimes you get into these um, states of consciousness and everything seems to look different. So the idea is we get into this front of our brain. If we then look at the past, it doesn't look the same way it looked before. And so there, there's literally a shift perspective because now mm. if we're not in this part of our brain, our energy is not in the past because this part of the brain is associated with the past. Because it's always trying to protect us from something in the past. So when that happens, we have more energy that is going into the past, more mental energy that is devoted. Our processing, our mental energy is in the past. When we shift into the now, into the front of our brain, we have our energy that is over there is all being brought here. We're now fully more fully present. But if we then contemplate that whatever happened in the past, we can look at it and it just looks different. And that's what's yeah. called a shift of perception. Um, no, that's this. That's actually what happens. I know this with phobias, uh, fears, um, anxiety, and also things that happened in the past, and and also our concept of self and 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 and, and, yeah. and, tra and, and trauma as well. Um, of course, with hypnosis, we can also use suggestion. We can also use visualization. We can actually have an experience like that, and we can in a in a way that is non traumatizing. Um, we can take a person into that, and we can clear the emotional a lot of the emotional attachment that is in that previous experience from the past is and that like reprogramming like, is that kind of like a reprogramming the software there are various ways to do it but one of the most common ways is what we call the re rewind technique which is we kind of imagine it on a screen the aim of that technique is to get a kind of um dissociation but in a positive sense because sometimes if you ah, okay um had yeah. a difficult or traumatic experience, a painful experience, what we're often doing is we're thinking about it over and over, we're reliving it, and we're um, we're imagining it through our eyes. So it feels like it's yeah. still happening. Yeah, um, absolutely. In I can relate to that. What, what is meant to happen, we sometimes get stuck there in that, that association. But, but people that are able to move um, out of the trauma or pain and fear, they tend to be able to stand back from that experience and to look at it as if they're reviewing someone else's experience, as if they're, you know, yeah. reading this in a book or hearing it from someone else. And you can feel um, empathy, but but you're not traumatized by it. It's it's the recognition that that is in the past. It's not now. It's in the past. And what mm -hmm. that does frees up the mental energy. Um, the person becomes more present. And um, yeah, and that that's part of it too. And that, uh, that was yes. Yeah, it's, it's, um, fascinating i did use hypnosis i was working with um a friend of mine it was one of the influences that got me into hypnosis sarah bailey and we did hypnosis and coaching together um for many years and also meditated together but i was also combining meditation like zen with yeah. um them kind of um with exercise and something just happened in my brain and, and basically what happened was what I just described. I looked at my past while well, I was literally in meditation one day and I suddenly had this realization, my past is just the past. Mm. Yes, it happened, yeah, but it's, I, I was no longer living in the past. It felt like I was back in the now, in the moment. And when I, when I would look at the past, it now looks different, you know? Mm. Um, and I literally had a release from my past and what I noticed and same thing that clients notice is that 
once you have that kind of emotional release um, and that shift is that you feel more peaceful and you feel like your energy levels go up. Now, I believe, and their research kind of, um, there's some theories around this, that that is in fact um, what happens in the brain and the body, that when that happens, you're shifting from past to present, any energy that is, is being used in a, you know, to kind of all of the extra processing to protect you, to keep oh, your yeah. brain in survival mode, you know, you may not clear everything, but what was being used over here is like you have more brain and more brain power, more processing speed and, and, and energy yeah. available. And that means you can be more fully present now. Um, and that tends to also lead to further shifts because the more now you are, the more that things, you know, you've, you kind of get more of your energy back and you're, you find it easier to kind of make other, other kind of changes. You know, it's, uh, otherwise it's occurring to me now, but shamans, um, one of the things like in there from their belief system, um, and I think Shaman, a lot yeah. of manic practice, you know, that up to like 50,000 years ago, apparently, but a lot of these things that we're doing today kind of uh, are in a sense are very shamanic in a way. We can see that there are, you know, it's almost like we're practicing a kind of modern form of that. Um, and one oh, of their beliefs was, was that the soul would come in, but as we had trauma, we would lose little bits, would kind of break off and they would go in high places. They would, you know, and one of the visualization practices they would use um, is to um, kind of go into what they would call like, like imagine going down into the earth and you kind of notice that there's a part of you that's hiding underneath a rock. And then you communicate with that part. And what do the shamans do? They get that person to bring, once they communicate with it and it feels, mm. safe, they ask it to come back into the body and they bring it into the heart. So when, and this literally, they knew that, but we also, I think modern, you know, brain science and, and so on shows it in a different way. That's what we're doing. We're actually getting the energy back that was being stuck in the past. And, yeah. and, and that's increasing our mental capacity to be in the now. And that means not only does that change, but it means we have more energy for positive progression. I'm going to have to get going, but it's yes, need to, um... wonderful being here. It's been a wonderful discussion, I think. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. I think what, you, you, what you're sharing is, is very instrumental and it can be um, part of a holistic treatment. And some of the things that mm. we do find hard is, is about how ADHD affects relationships and that uh, trust issue is normally deep rooted. And if you can, can go back and... Uh, to the past when that first happened and release that then it could open open your heart to to really mm. have that relationship you already mm. always wanted exactly so how can people find out more about hypnosis well of course they can go they can go and ch check out um on my website there's um an faq which answers a lot of questions about hypnosis um and um there's a uh, blog and videos and there's information on the website and that's an advantage hypnotherapy uk, but it's two d's as in add so add advantage hypnotherapy uk. fantastic thank you very much and um, thank thanks for joining us today thank you sue yes yeah, it's been a pleasure thank you for downloading you've been listening to the celebrating adhd podcast empowering people to reach their full potential Please follow us on the Celebrating ADHD Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter or join the members area at www.celebratingadhd.com. We are already good enough the way we are. Celebrating ADHD works best combined as a holistic treatment program, so we advise you to consult your health specialist for medical advice. If you are not sure if you have ADHD, please get in touch as we can recommend a medical expert as the diagnosis is all part of the journey.